So I just want to begin by telling you that I'm also a Stanford alum, um, and I came to Stanford after, as was already mentioned I, by Harsha, I came to Stanford after a 10-year career in this professional ballet. Um, I think my parents were absolutely horrified. They're both academics. They could not understand what had gone wrong, that I had taken this, made this decision. But then after 10 years of doing this, I was admitted to Stanford, probably the oldest freshman in the history of Stanford. I was 27 in my first year. And then I got a chance to go to medical school and really have a second dream come true. And after that, I came back to Stanford. And since 2009, I've been teaching on this, these topics, child health and child nutrition. And people ask me, what is the most pressing issue in your mind with regard to our children's health? And I say to them, without a doubt, for me, the most pressing issue is this environment of eating, this culture of eating in which our children are growing up. The typical supermarket, these are the processed food aisles at one of the most popular superstores in America. And a typical supermarket has about 47,000 processed foods available. They are, for the most part, rearrangements of corn and soy, and they give us the impression that we have a huge amount of choice. But in general, these are the foods that we're feeding our children. And our children's health is at risk because of this eating environment. So when I first came to Stanford at the age of 27, I saw pictures like this and heard phrases like socio-cultural determinants of health, and I thought, wow, if I just keep my mouth shut, maybe no one will notice that I'm not as smart as everybody else and I will somehow manage to get my degree anyway. But what I realized over time was that all this means, and this is what I tell my students, is what is it about the environment in which our children are growing up that is either protecting them or increasing their risk of disease? So that's how I present it to my students now. And it becomes especially personal when you are raising children in an environment, as I am, and you start to look around at that environment and say, what is it about this environment that is either protecting them or putting them at risk for poor health outcomes? So let me tell you a story, because stories are always the best way, right? So this is a story about my three boys and the culture of eating in which they're growing up. They are growing up in something that could be described as a giant food fair, where processed food options are available on every corner, and it's socially acceptable to eat them at any time of the day. I, as a mother, am expected to have a purse full of snacks in Ziploc bags, so that at any given moment, if my child howls, I can pull out a bag of something like goldfish crackers or gummy bears and quickly feed it to my child to calm down that moment, that potential tantrum, right? Avoid disaster. Then, if we keep going and looking at this environment, my children are spending seven hours a day or more at school, right? And at school, for the most part, they are being offered processed foods. And that is not only feeding them less than ideal nutrition, it's also teaching them that these are appropriate choices to make. Big changes are underway thanks to Michelle Obama. In 2012, regulations came down from above about the number of times a week our children can be served french fries and tater tots in their school lunches. So thank goodness that we're moving in the right direction, but I think we still have a ways to go. If I keep on this path of describing the food environment that my children are growing up in, we see a place in time where parents are stressed, they're at work, they need something for the children to do after school when they come home. After school activities are expensive and they require somebody to transport the children there. Grandparents often are not as close as they once were to help look after the children. So what we end up doing often is just putting them in front of a screen because it's safe and it keeps them happy where we can see them. Now this is concerning for two reasons, because firstly, obviously, they're not being physically active during this time that they're in front of a screen, but secondly, they're being exposed to 
pretty aggressive advertising for, in general, the wrong kinds of food. So approximately $2 billion a year are spent marketing foods to our children, and nobody monitors the nutritional content of the food. The food companies are supposed to police themselves. Children, it's very hard for them to rationalize, I know this food is not good for me, it's not appealing to me. These are pretty aggressive marketing campaigns. And then what we do is we take everything and we basically supersize it because of the fact that we live in a part of the world where we value size, we value, we want to feel that we are getting bang for our buck. And so unfortunately that's translated into larger portion sizes of pretty much all of the foods that we are eating and feeding our children. And that leaves us with a public health crisis. It is a disease that really threatens to leave our children with a shorter life expectancy than their parents if we don't turn things around soon. Childhood obesity is associated with a host of illnesses from high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, all of these diseases that we once thought of as diseases of adulthood that are now creeping into younger and younger age groups. The scary part of that as a parent is that we're gonna be seeing the side effects of those diseases at a much younger age than we would have had these diseases started when a person is in their you know, older ad adulthood years. And so that is very scary as a parent. Here we are, this is where we are today. We have an obesity rate in our children of approximately 17% across all um, groups. And this is how our obesity rates look in terms of the adults. This is us compared to a few other countries. We are now at 31.8% obesity in the United States. And then I ask myself, how did we get here? Because in the early 1900s, children of America were actually underweight for age. And I wonder how this happened to us. So if you look back, you will see in history that in the 1930s, the government started distributing surplus agricultural commodities to schools that served hot lunches. It was a way of addressing this problem of underweight children, of malnourished, undernourished children. And it worked. And it, there was a wonderful sort of positive image of this hot lunch program, such that the New Yorker called it the warm sun around which American education revolves. And to many, the school lunch program maintained that positive image. But what actually happened in the 80s was that the fast food companies and the processed food companies took over the school lunch program so that Monday was Pizza Hut Day and Pizza Hut would fund the new music program. Fridays was Hamburger Day. Do you guys remember having Hamburger Day? I remember it at my school. And Hamburger Day would be supplied by McDonald's if, and McDonald's, you know, would somehow get involved in the school, build a new gymnasium. And what happened, their motivation was, if we can get these children to be brand loyal at a young age, we've got them for life. Because there's a lot of research to show that the foods that children learn to prefer in childhood will be the foods they prefer as adults. And that that will be past that preference from one generation to the next. There are actually animal models for this. They took cats and they trained those cats using stimulation of certain parts of the brain, pleasure centers in the brain. They trained those cats to like bananas over meat pellets. So they trained them to prefer an inappropriate food. And then what they found was when those cats had kittens, the kittens, without any intervention, without any training or stimulation, they went for the bananas as well because they had tasted the bananas, presumably, in the milk, in the mother's milk, and they had seen the behavior, they had seen the mothers going crazy for these bananas, and they wanted to imitate. So if we extrapolate, that means that we are powerful role models for our children. The foods that we choose will likely be their choice as well, and the way in which we eat will likely be the way in which they decide to eat as well. So at present, only about one-third of American children regularly sit down to a family meal, 
And there's a lot of data showing that there are really protective factors and, and benefits to sitting down together and talking and sharing ideas. So I talk to hundreds of families every year and they tell me sometimes, okay, but what am I gonna do? My child will not eat anything that's not white. If it's not pasta, if it's not white bread, they just won't eat it, what am I supposed to do? And that got me interested. So I started learning everything I could about this phenomenon called food neophobia. And food neophobia is thought to occur between the ages of two and five when children hesitate or refuse, flat out refuse, to eat anything that they do not recognize or that they have not tasted before. It's thought to be protective because when a child is old enough to toddle away from the mom, you don't want them to go eat the wood chips. You want them to eat something that they know to be safe, right? So this brings with it, of course, the, you know, the responsibility for us as parents to expose them to a variety of things before this kicks in so that they won't be as phobic. And what, what of course, we feed them, what their pediatrician recommended first food is this, rice cereal. It's hypoallergenic. It's big nutrition for tiny tummies, apparently. It's got a happy baby on the front. See there, the happy baby. And this, what this is, is actually baby processed food because it converts into sugar very rapidly in, in the body of the child once they've eaten it. And so this is already sort of a less than ideal start. But what's most interesting is that I spent three months in South Africa in 2012 working with these children between the ages of two and five years of age. They, interestingly, and these were none of these children were food insecure. They all were eating five meals a day, but they're uh, three meals and two snacks, but their meals, at least two or three of them, were coming out of a single big silver pot, the pot of the school chef. Her name was Noyena, and she cooked for those children mealy pap, sump and beans. She sauteed spinach for them. She cooked butternut squash for them. Whatever came out of that pot, these children would eat. So I thought, wait a minute, what if we take vegetables that they've never seen before, like broccoli and bell peppers, because these children had never eaten those vegetables before. And guess what? If it came out of Noyena's pot, the plates came back clean. So this could mean a couple of things. It could be the fact that these are very polite children. There were 95 of them. Maybe they had been trained. This is a visitor, eat the food that she cooks for six weeks, maybe. It could also be the fact that being living in an under-resourced part of the world, even though they weren't food insecure, they understood the value of food more. But it could also be the fact that they knew that anything that came out of the trusted pot was safe to eat and would be good for them, and they would eat it. Now, how do we get our children, our preschoolers, to eat? Well, in 2007, Tom Robinson did an experiment where he wrapped foods in McDonald's wrappers or in unmarked wrappers, and guess what? Our preschoolers said across the board that it tastes better, the McDonald's wrapped food tastes better. These were identical foods, and they ate more of the foods wrapped in the McDonald's wrapper. So have our processed food marketing strategies worked so well that our children identify foods wrapped in McDonald's wrappers as being safe and desirable, just as the South African kids identified Noyena's pot as being safe and desirable. When I ask my students at Stanford, smart Stanford students, when I ask them, you have a six month old, I say, and they look at me with terror in their eyes and I say, okay, now, six month old, this is their first solid food. Are you going to feed them this or this? And they are honest with me and all of the hands go up. They will feed them this because I say, why? Why, why will you feed them this? Because it's safe, they say. We don't know if this is safe to feed a baby. This is baby food, right? It's got a baby on it. It says baby food. And so they're gonna choose this because we have been so successfully convinced that we do not have the skills to create our own food to feed our offspring that we need to rely on a processed food industry to make that food. Let me just tell you, these things scare me. These are called toddler meat sticks. On the front it says, 
turkey added with canola oil packed in water. So I'm thinking these are turkey sticks, right? I look at the back, the first ingredients are pork and beef. Okay, so that's strange. These have a USDA stamp of approval on it. There's really a very happy and healthy looking baby on here. And these sticks, which I bought, not kidding you, a year ago, I have been using this jar as an example for one year, and they are still good until August 2014. Now for my students to think that this is safer for a child than something like this tells me that we've gone wrong. Okay, then I just wanna bring up again this concept of portion distortion. When we feed our children bigger portions of everything, not only does it distort their idea of what an appropriate portion size is, it actually causes them to consume more. In 1996 at Cornell University, they did a famous experiment where they took moviegoers and gave them popcorn, either in large buckets or medium-sized buckets. The popcorn was stale, purposefully, it was stale popcorn, and they asked the people beforehand how hungry they were. They asked them to rate their hunger level. Now, regardless of how hungry they were and regardless of how they rated the taste of the popcorn, the people served in the larger containers consumed more popcorn. So we actually, there's good evidence to suggest that we actually consume more when there's more on our plate. Just some little trivia for you to get your minds working a bit. Cheeseburger 20 years ago was 333 calories. Just think in your mind what that might be like today and I'll give you the answer. I don't wanna to take too long. 590 calories. 20 years ago, a serving of spaghetti was 500 calories. Now, 1,025 1, calories, a caloric difference of 525 calories. French fries, 20 years ago, 210 calories. Today, almost three times, 610 calories in a regular serving of French fries. And soda, of course, we have to talk about soda. 85 calories 20 years ago, and the typical portion today is 250 calories. And again, this is, this is a big problem for our children because the soda industry is spending half a billion dollars every year to market directly to our children. That's just their budget for marketing to our children. Just to give you an idea, the average American consumes 130 pounds of sugar every year. And preschoolers, just the preschoolers, are seeing about 213 ads per year for sugar-sweetened beverages. So this is, again, one of the big challenges we're facing. Now, is it any wonder then that this has led to a broken relationship with our food? I have a friend who moved here from China, mainland China, with her children, and our children became friends. We went there for dinner one night. She was mincing garlic while we stood around and drank a glass of wine. It was really lovely. And she said to me, in very simple English, English is her second language, she said to me, it's strange. In China, we love food. Food is part of every celebration and every day. She said to me, in America, people fear food. They think food will make me fat. And I thought to myself, what a powerful comment. Because if we lose our relationship with food, we are going to pass on that anxiety to our children. And that's the last thing we want to do. We have to find a way to make food celebratory because it is one of the great joys in life. And so if we can find a way to go back to basics, this was uh, the massive open online course that we taught last spring. And we basically encouraged parents to celebrate food with their children. It didn't have to be high wire cooking. It was simple, whatever you have in the kitchen, chop it up, minimize the number of recipes and ingredient lists you ever need to deal with in your life, but go for it. Because this could be one of the most powerful tools we have in the fight against childhood obesity. We can make this change happen because we have a vested interest in the end product when we get out our kitchen pots. And the processed food industry does not. They have a vested interest in making a profit and not in our, the long-term health of our children. 
I wanted to just show you the trailer for this um, course because we're going to be offering it again in January if any of you want to join. It's become socially acceptable to eat it at any time of the day and to feed it to our children at any time of the day. This is not a cosmetic problem. It's not about being teased at school. This is a public health crisis. You can protect your child's health and come together as a family. Let me show you how. Okay, so we had really a wonderful experience. In fact, we have some people here who were in the course. We had more than 35,000 people sign up to take the course from all around the world. And it's funny because a lot of the hesitancy to begin uh, cooking at home comes sometimes from a feeling of, firstly, I'm not trained. I don't have the training to make this into something that's better than this. So that skill, that's one barrier that we need to overcome, the perception that we don't have the skills. People also think home cooking is going to be expensive. I'm going to have to buy a lot of fancy ingredients, and I don't have that you know, necessarily the financial backing to do that. And thirdly, they think that somehow this is going to take a lot of time. So I thought I would show you how much time it takes to make baby food. So what I did this morning when I woke up is I took something that looked like this, I wrapped it in foil, and I put it in the oven. That took maybe 15 seconds to do. Literally go squish oven on and walk away. And then as I was leaving, I picked it up and I put it in my, in my bag. Okay, so now I want to show you how, how tricky it is to make baby food from scratch. So that the yam got nicely caramelized. I'm just going to pull the skin off here. Mm, this actually smells really good. Okay, so I've got my skin off. Assuming I'm making this for like a six month old, first time, first solid foods. Now I'm going to take a fork and mash that up. OK, guess what? I'm done. OK, and this, I looked at my receipt. This cost me 29 cents. That one was smaller, so it would have cost me less. 29 cents. This, 129. And out of this, I could make at least two jars full of baby food. So it is not time consuming, it is not skill requiring, and I, in many ways I think if people realized how, that it was also economically a viable solution, now I've got sweet potato on my hands, they would some, somehow make the decision to try this at least. It's a powerful solution. Now, why are we doing this? I think one of the most powerful reasons for considering a shift away from processed food and back into the kitchen is that these little people don't have a choice. We are making decisions for them that will affect their health for the rest of their lives. And I know every parent I've ever met has said to me, my children are the most important thing in my life. I would do anything to protect their health. So as a final word, I would like to say that I respect that love that parents have for their children. And I think that can be harnessed to really make subtle changes that will support the health of our children. Cooking and eating at home adds value to our lives. And we can really take the power that we have in, the, in that kitchen pot and use it to protect our children. So I wish for you all that you cook and eat and enjoy together. And thank you very much for, for listening. I'll take questions if you have any. Yes. 
Yeah, it's so frustrating, you know, when you read books like uh, Hole and the China Study, you know, until you mentioned Cornell and Dr. Campbell. Um, I know he's struggled for years. He's such a prominent scientist uh, at the public policy level, trying to come take a top-down approach. I totally agree. This only way to change America is, you know, one person at a time. As a physician, I, you know, I talk to about my patients who want to know about what good nutrition is, and they're just starving for information. Uh, I just, I applaud you in putting this sort of thing together, and just, you know, would like to really emphasize, you know, is there a way we can, that, uh, you know, medical systems and universities can somehow uh, uh, get together and, and try to, you know, get, get that, get the message out, get the education to the people, because uh, you just uh, you're fighting against the USDA, even even organizations that sounds like they should be protecting our health, like the USDA or the National Cancer Institute, you just can't do it or just yeah. won't do it. There's too much money at stake. The, the meat and dairy industry, the processed food industry, like you say, is all, all profit driven. So, is there? A, do you see a way through your educational efforts um, to um, to get the word out, not just to the students in the schools or the people who are interested, because this is probably the choir you're preaching to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, and, and just you know, look at how many people are here. Uh, it's it can get us down a little bit, but yeah. uh, I, every day I'm motivated because I see it making a difference to my patients when, when they actually start cooking for themselves, when they start moving more towards a plant-based diet. You know, yes. they just say, "Wow, this is so easy. How come nobody's told me about this?" Yeah, and I think, for example, the, the online learning platforms that we now see emerging, like Coursera and Open edX, these platforms allow us to reach out. If we do it in the right way, in the right language, we can actually reach the people that need this message the most. I think the biggest challenge for us as educators is to really make the message, deliver it in a di digestible form that really is appropriate for the broadest variety of viewer and not just for people who are already highly motivated and highly educated and are you know taking this because it's sort of validating for them and i think so we need to simplify things we need to make things accessible and enjoyable and fun and things that maybe are in terms of their time commitment realistic for working busy parents so I, I see great hope in online education as, as a public health outreach tool, you know, and I think that we, we can make a difference and there are many organizations now trying to encourage uh, people to cook at home. There's a magazine that I'm sure you've heard of called Chop Chop that's all about how do we get children engaged in cooking from an early age and there's a lot of creative stuff going on. I think we just need to, you know, be the people who spread the word and keep moving in this direction in a positive way and not in a punitive way because whenever you bring stress into the equation with food, it's not a good combination. So if we can keep things positive, we have a better chance. Yes? I just want to say I live in Portland, Oregon and what a lot of people in Oregon are doing is they're bringing into the classroom in the elementary schools and teaching the kids how to cook so that they'll go home and teach their parents how to cook. And I'm a massage therapist, and my platform, because I do believe it takes each person to change, is that I'm, I'm pregnant right now, and when I have the baby, there's a program at the naturopath clinic, and it's a master's of science and nutrition, and I feel like through my massage clients that are asking me, because I have three major food allergies and they hear me talk about it, I'm, I'm their resource to try to help teach them. And, there's a, a small group of people, and, well, a large group of people in Portland that are putting on classes and making it very affordable, like $10, and teaching people how to cook. And it's really amazing. And, and I know that's a big part of Portland is very different from the rest of the country, but I feel like anytime we can get out there, and you know, a lot of health coaches are coming out, and it's just, I'm also gonna open a wellness center that's centered around food, yeah. and lots of different other practitioners so that people come in, on different modalities, they have a place to go, and there's gonna be a kitchen in there, and it's just like, for me, that's how I'm gonna change my small group of people. Right. And it's actually interesting hearing about what you've done on the web, because that's what I've been hearing about being here, 
And so now I'm gonna start looking into that is how can I put stuff on the web to outreach other people? Yeah. So probably for you, just networking with other people that specialize in it and referring your clients to it. Yes. Um, I, I don't know, I guess maybe I'm a little more cynical um, in terms of, uh, I, I work in public health, so yes. you know I feel like it's very complex and Absolutely. every family is different and even from a parent perspective, I had one child who was always a little bit overweight, now I'm happy to say as a, a teenager he trimmed down and then my daughter, same house, same food, same school, same every environment, one was a little heavy, one was normal weight. Right. Um, so it's, it's very complex, but um, what do you think about um, the kids? Because I feel like most people know what's healthy and what's not. Maybe I'm naive, but people know, except your students who pick the <laughs> jar baby food over the yam. But, um, <laughs> but I think a lot of people know what's healthy, but it's like habits, it's environment, it's um, like mom, the pediatrician every year, mom, she couldn't tell me I'm fat again. Every year it was the yeah, same thing, yeah. you know, like, um, that, you know, they know, but it's it's hard. Right, absolutely. And, and how do you get to the kids? Yes, and I think the key here is to remain supportive. Nobody is being chastised. The environment is an, an environment that is obesogenic, that is unhealthy for our children. But, for example, if we can encourage parents that even if their children don't want to eat the foods that they know to be healthy, if the parents eat those foods, if the children are just visually exposed to adults that they trust eating certain foods, one day when they're in college making their own decisions, they will hopefully make the right choices. Even seeing foods, there's a lot of research that's been done at Stanford about reading books about vegetables to children and how that can make them more adventurous. So I think also telling parents it's okay if you don't get it right every time. It's okay if you only have time to cook once a week. That's better than not cooking at all. You know, freeze that soup in three Tupperwares in the freezer and take it out on a couple of nights, you know, of the week so that you can just make small changes in the right direction. None of us are perfect. We're all struggling. I know on my way home after a long day at work when I'm tired, I think, oh, should I just stop and pick something up? I know that feeling. And so I think just having that moment where you think, do I have the strength today, on this day, to go home and peel a carrot and boil it and make some pasta? Simple. Do I have, do I have the energy in me? And some days you'll say, no, I just don't have it in me. And then go for it. Choose, try and choose something that's a little bit healthier if you're going to bring food in from home. As, as choose the best food that you can afford, you know. But I think it's, it's always kind of a balance. People need to be aware that every time they go for that other option of going home and just whipping up something simple, they are making a difference that will add up over time in their children's lives. That's what I'm thinking. It's, it's never going to be perfect. And I think we need to support parents, let them know that we understand the pressures on them and that they are doing a great job. I, when I worked in South Africa, the mothers would look at each other these were poor mothers. They slept, some of them, five on a mattress in a shack in a township. And those mothers would look at each other and they would say, you are doing a wonderful job of raising these children. And it touched me because all I remember from raising children at that young age was other mothers saying, oh, can you believe she lets him eat that? I can't believe. And the kind of judgment that we put on each other because of the fact that we have so much choice and we're insecure. Are we making the right choice? If I can put down somebody else's choice, then I'll feel more secure about the choice I've made. And I think that that does us no good. We need to come together as a society, as a society of parents, and support one another and say, you are doing a great job in raising this child. Let me help you. How can we work together to make this happen? One, two, and three. Can we take three more? Can we do three more? Yes. OK. So my question is, is what are your thoughts about the standards that are used in the pediatrician's office, like the BMI chart and the height chart? We have five kids, and they're all different shapes and sizes. We're not, we're not big people, but yeah. you know, our kids differ, and we have a lot of you know, there's a lot of different genes coming yes. from. So what are your thoughts on the 
the standards that in the pediatrician's office that they use. And then they see and they're like, oh, I'm fat. Yes. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Look, I think it's never good for a child to feel bad about the way they look or, you know, that, again, taking stress away out of the equation is always the preference when we're talking about food. And I think we need to emphasize health at any size. As long as a child is, you know, offered a variety of nutritious foods, it is up to that child to decide how much and which of those nutritious options they want to eat. And then as long as they're being physically active, you know, the recommendations are approximately an hour a day, but that can be cumulative, that can be 10 minutes riding to school with another half an hour of PE, you know, it can be a, some total of 60 minutes a day. If all of these things are in place and we've eliminated the kind of two liter soda and the potato chips, then you celebrate the health of a healthy child. And that should be the emphasis, you know? In this family, we eat in a certain way, we use moderation in all that we do, and we are healthy because of the way in which we live. I think that should be our emphasis. Did you have one? Well, it's really specific. Um, we, have, we have a child that's genetically related who's thin, and then one that's adopted who comes from a really heavy family. Yeah. And, so we, we're dealing with this, and we are trying to do, um, keep a lot of fruit and vegetables available. Love but this specific question has to do with bananas, because it, it fits into that. Um, the, the younger one with the weight problem just, you know, he could eat like 12 bananas a day. What is, is that, what is the nutritional, you know, how does that affect obesity if, yeah. with that particular food? <laughs> so in general, I would say there are no inherently healthy or unhealthy foods. The question is always, what would you be eating instead of that food. So for example, if I deep fry potatoes in my home, that is probably not as healthy as a quinoa and cucumber salad, right? But if the alternative is going to McDonald's and getting a Happy Meal, those home fried potatoes are looking pretty good. So I think it's about making the better choice. And children go through phases when they crave certain foods, maybe they actually need a nutrient in that food. And if it's bananas, if bananas are the biggest problem you have, I would say count yourself lucky, you know, and go, go with the bananas. But then I also think children should learn about moderation and how, you know, our bodies need some of a certain thing. Maybe have two bananas. Maybe 12 might be a bit much for your body. Let's try and moderate. I think that's a missing link in many of our discussions around food is getting back a culture that emphasizes moderation over excess in any one direction. Was there a question up there? Yeah. So public schools in this country are providing breakfast and lunch to, at a free or reduced price to, a, a, to varying numbers of percentages of children in their, in their reach. And um, they're, I, what I've seen is they're mostly giving them calories and not necessarily needing, really providing truly nutritious, um, high value food that you've um, discussed here. I'm curious, have you had the opportunity to have conversations with decision makers of, you know, who, who decide school lunch programs about moving in more in this direction? I mean, I think in, certainly in Oregon, Full disclosure, I'm living there now. I see a lot of schools have little gardens and the children in the lower grades get excited when they're eating the vegetables that, that they saw in the garden that they contributed to and that, that partly helps, but I know we can't do that everywhere. Have you, have you had any success in making inroads there? Right, and you know, we have made, as a nation, we've made progress in the past couple of years. In 2012, finally, the changes were finally instituted in the School Lunch Act where there were limits placed on, for example, the number of French fries, as I mentioned. Um, vegetables, you know, had, there had to be certain number of servings of vegetables. And processed food was, you know, minimized by law from the beginning of 2012 to some extent. But as you're saying, it's, a, it's such a battle because, for example, you heard the debate about does a tomato paste constitute a vegetable if it's placed on pizza, and it did. And so, I mean, there are ways in which these are powerful forces, these processed food lobbyists. And because of the nature of that food, because it's heavily subsidized food, 
in terms of the raw material, the corn and the soy, these foods are cheap. And so the school lunch programs can balance their budgets much more easily if they're focusing on processed foods. And they're saying, this is all the kids will eat. Well, that's a very hard cycle to break. And I think we're moving in the right direction slowly, but I think in the interim, there's a lot to be said for a home-packed lunch if you suspect that your children are not being exposed to the right choices at school, a home-cooked lunch is a way of sending a little package of love into that seven-hour day of stress and sitting and listening. And I think that if we can do that maybe three, even three times a week and let them have the other food on the other two days a week, that's already better than, you know. So I think the, the answer is it's going to take time, and we are moving in the right direction. Michelle Obama has been extremely active in trying to change these things, but I think even her hands are tied to some extent. I mean, there was Michael Pollan's book, um, In Defense of Food. In that book, he describes how, you know, the recommendations, medical recommendations, we were not even allowed to say, cut back on red meat. Instead, we had to say, cut back on saturated fat, which led to this whole nutritionist mentality where everything is now nutrients. We can only talk about nutrients. So that gives the processed food manufacturers an even better chance because what they can now do is strip their foods of all the nutrients and add back extra iron, extra B12. Nobody knows what B12 does, but guess what? It's posted big and bright on the cereal. This now has added B vitamins. And so parents think, oh, okay, well, this must be good because it has a nutrition claim on it. So I think that we are fighting a very big battle, and I think we're starting to make progress, but it is, a, it is a fight. And in the interim, we need to protect our children because we can't wait. And the way in which we do that, I think, is we go home and we get those pots out and we start using them because that is a readily available solution that's also sustainable. And it's sort of the best thing we can do for right now. I wish I had a better answer for you. I'm more worried. I'm not worried about my child. Yeah. She's not doing the school lunch. Right. She asked last week, when can I do some hot lunch? I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. And we're just ignoring it. I, but I do worry. We have 47% of our student population in her school gets free or reduced price lunch. Yeah. And a number of kids getting served breakfast. Yeah. And the principal's very aware of, of the gap that they're, they're trying to meet. And, and we do live in a nice area, which is funny. Yeah. <laughs> so I worry about, about the so much about how the people who, who, who can't take the time, or think they can't take the time, who aren't in the room here listening to you, and, and their children are getting so much of their food from the school. And so it's, okay, yeah, there's no easy answer. For yeah, that. yeah, I wish I had a better answer for that. I think also we have to remember that our children are growing up in a culture. It is their culture, right? And we cannot isolate them from their culture. So some parents tell me, when my children go to birthday parties, I br they bring a watermelon with them, and they're, when the other kids eat the cake, they have to cut the watermelon op well and open and eat the watermelon. That's all they're allowed to eat. I'm not sure that that's right, because I think our children need to feel that they can fit in. It is the culture in which they are growing up. And I think if we teach them, it's OK when you're at a birthday party to have the cake, if that's, if, as long as you don't have a dietary restriction that limits you from having the cake. And then, I mean, I have a real limitation. I have a child with celiac disease, my middle one. And so when he goes to birthday parties, he really can't have the cake. And what I have started doing is baking like two dozen really nice homemade chocolate cupcakes. And I send them with him to the birthday party so he can be like, I brought chocolate cupcakes, and they're good. They're good chocolate cupcakes, but they're all made with homemade ingredients. And then all the children can share, and he gets to feel like he's having something that all the kids are eating. So I artificially create a situation in which he's not the pariah getting the yucky food that, and not allowed to have what everybody else is having. And I think it's a balance between allowing our children to fit into the world that they live in and educating them about moderation and about how these are the choices that we make most of the time because this is how our family does it. And I'm getting a sign that I think we have to wrap up. It has been such a pleasure to talk with all of you, and I hope I will get a chance to correspond with you more in the future. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your weekend.